The next type of blood vessels are the capillaries, referred to as exchange vessels, because it is at the capillaries where the exchange of substances, such as nutrients from blood, are given to tissue cells, and wastes from tissue cells are given to blood. This includes the exchange of gases oxygen from blood to tissue cells, and carbon dioxide from tissue cells to blood. This is referred to as capillary exchange. These capillaries are microscopic blood vessels with a diameter so small that red blood cells must travel in a single file to fit in their lumens. Their walls are extremely thin, which only consist of the tunica intima or interna. This thinness is absolutely necessary if the exchange of materials, substances, and gases is to occur. Almost every tissue and their cells are directly supplied by at least one capillary bed. Only avascular tissue is void of any capillaries, such as cartilage, epithelial tissue, the cornea, and lens of the eye. These avascular tissues rely on diffusion from tissues that are supplied by blood. Capillaries intertwine and interweave to form a network called a capillary bed. So, any given capillary bed can have anywhere from 10 to 100 interwoven capillaries, depending upon the tissue and the organ. If we look at the diagram below, we have a terminal arteriole and a metaarteriole that directly branches off of the terminal arteriole. It is the metaarteriole that leads blood into the capillary bed. In fact, one terminal arteriole can have several metaarterioles that branch off of it, therefore supplying blood to several capillary beds. From the capillary bed, blood then flows into the post-capillary venule. So we have terminal arteriole to metaarteriole to capillary bed to post-capillary venule. Blood flow from metaarteriole to capillary bed to post-capillary venule is referred to as microcirculation. At any given capillary bed, there will be two paths or routes for blood to flow through. Let us consider the first route of blood flow. This consists of a metaarteriole leading to a thoroughfare channel, which then drains into a post-capillary venule. This is called a vascular shunt. So blood flows from metaarteriole to thoroughfare channel to postcapillary venule. It is important to note that there will be no exchange of materials, substances, or gases when blood passes through a vascular shunt. This route allows blood to directly go from arterial system to venous system, bypassing any capillary exchange. Let us now consider the second route of blood flow. This consists of a metaarteriole to the true capillaries. It is at the true capillaries where exchange of materials, substances, and gases can occur. Should blood go through these true capillaries, we can have the exchange between blood and the tissue cells, basically capillary exchange. So blood flows from metaarteriole to true capillaries to postcapillary venule. Take note that between the metaarteriole and at the entrance of the true capillaries are structures called precapillary sphincters. These sphincters consist of smooth muscle cells that wrap around the lumen at the entrance of the true capillary, as shown here. Having these smooth muscle cells gives these sphincters the ability to contract which constricts the lumen and completely closes off the entrance into the true capillary, and the ability to relax, which dilates the lumen and completely opens the entrance into the true capillary. There are no precapillary sphincters found anywhere along the vascular shunt. If we carefully look at this diagram, we see that the sphincters are relaxed the lumens are dilated, and the entrances into the true capillaries are open. 
This now allows blood to flow not only through the vascular shunt, but through the true capillaries as well. So there is blood flow throughout the capillary bed. If we look at this diagram, we see that the sphincters are contracted. The lumens are constricted and the entrances into the true capillaries are closed. This now shuts off blood flow into the true capillaries. So blood is restricted to only flow through the vascular shunt since no precapillary sphincters are present along its length. The smooth muscle tissue of the precapillary sphincters intermittently contract and relax. So these precapillary sphincters vasoconstrict and vasodilate the true capillaries anywhere between 5 to 10 times per minute. This is an example of what is referred to as vasomotion. This vasomotion is under local control, in other words, autoregulation, which means that locally produced chemicals and the concentration of gases, nutrients and wastes in the tissues will determine the extent of constriction and dilation. For example, the higher the concentration of waste products produced by tissue cells that are metabolically active, the longer and more frequent these precapillary sphincters will relax, which will now dilate the lumen, allowing for blood now to travel through the true capillaries to deliver the nutrients and to pick up the wastes. In fact, the more metabolically active the tissue, the more extensive and the more numerous the capillary beds. Examples of highly metabolically active tissues are the brain, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle. More details to come later when we further discuss the arterioles and their influence on blood flow into the capillary bed. Let us now discuss the different types of capillaries. We have three types, continuous capillaries, fenestrated capillaries, and sinusoidal capillaries, or simply sinusoids. Depending on the function of the organ or tissue will determine the appropriate type of capillaries they will have. Despite their apparent differences, they all only have a tunica intima or interna composed of endothelium anchored to a basement membrane and tight junctions between these endothelial cells. Our first type of capillary is the continuous capillary. It is the most common type and supplies most tissues of the body with the exception of avascular tissues. In addition to tight junctions between the endothelial cells, there are very small gaps or boundaries called intercellular clefts. These clefts allow for passage of fluid and small solutes such as glucose that can squeeze between these clefts. Larger solutes are simply too big to fit. However, when it comes to the brain, these continuous capillaries only have tight junctions with no intercellular clefts. Furthermore, astrocytes cling to these continuous capillaries forming the blood-brain barrier. This restricts the substances and solutes the neurons are exposed to. The thymus gland is another tissue that does not have intercellular clefts and form what is referred to as the blood thymus barrier. The thymus gland is part of the lymphatic system and immunity. Some continuous capillaries have cells that are called pericytes or pericapillary cells, which could be fibroblast, macrophage, or undifferentiated smooth muscle. Their functions aren't entirely clear but it is thought that they may be involved in regulating blood flow through the capillary and may play a role in the repair and growth of the vessel. In addition to the continuous capillaries, there are two other types of capillaries, the fenestrated capillaries and the sinusoidal capillaries. These capillaries are found in specific tissues and organs and are not as numerous as the continuous capillaries. Let's begin with the fenestrated capillaries. These capillaries are in tissues and organs that are involved in filtration, such as the kidneys, absorption, such as the intestines, and secretion, such as the endocrine glands. In addition to intercellular clefts found between the endothelial cells, they have pore-like structures called fenestrations or fenestri. 
these fenestrations or fenestri penetrate through the endothelial cell. So they are unlike the intercellular clefts that are found between the endothelial cells. Imagine that you have a slice of Swiss cheese. The cheese is the endothelial cell, which of course is simple squamous epithelium, while the pores or holes that are found throughout the slice of cheese are the fenestrations or fenestri. Now, if we have two slices of Swiss cheese that are laid side by side, the gap between the slices is the intercellular cleft. The purpose of these fenestrations is to allow for increased permeability, which means that larger sized substances that normally would not be able to pass through the narrow intercellular clefts are now able to pass through these wider fenestrations, giving these substances the ability to either leave the blood vessel or enter the blood vessel. Some fenestrations have a thin diaphragm, while others do not. The last type of capillaries are the sinusoidal capillaries or sinusoids. We find these sinusoidal capillaries or sinusoids in tissues and organs such as the liver, the bone marrow, and the spleen. Compared to continuous and fenestrated capillaries, the sinusoidal capillaries have fewer tight junctions, larger fenestrations, wider intercellular clefts and usually have a larger sized lumen. And the basement membrane is incomplete or missing altogether. So why have these sinusoidal capillaries? It is because in tissues and organs that produce and secrete very large substances such as blood cells or cells found in blood and large proteins, these products must have the ability to enter the circulatory system by entering through these sinusoids. While in tissues and organs that interact with these large substances, they too would have these sinusoidal capillaries, so these products can leave the circulatory system by leaving through these sinusoids to interact with the tissue cells. So for example, the red bone marrow produces the cells found in blood, such as the red blood cells. Therefore, the red bone marrow contains sinusoidal capillaries. The newly produced red blood cells can enter the circulatory system by entering through the sinusoidal capillary. Over time, these red blood cells become old and damaged and will now need to be broken down and recycled. One organ that does this is the spleen, Therefore, the spleen also contains sinusoids, so these old damaged red blood cells can leave the circulatory system by leaving through the sinusoidal capillary to be recycled by the tissue cells of the spleen. Incidentally, blood flow through a sinusoidal capillary tend to be sluggish. For tissues and organs that produce large substances, this gives more time for the large substances produced by tissue cells to enter the circulatory system. And for tissues and organs that interact with large substances, this provides more time for these large substances to leave the circulatory system and interact with the tissue cells.